Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Zantonetti, and we're here this morning to bring you the Word of God. Thank you for coming into this Bible study, because this is what this is, is a Bible study. Talk Straight Bible is about the Bible and studying the Bible, and we do everything we can to present the truth to you every morning. Well, with that in mind, please keep also this in mind, that we are striving together to get to the place of unity in Christ. That is so important. Today's message is called The Promise of the Inheritance. The Promise of the Inheritance. Now, when people say that, they go, well, I received the promise of Jesus Christ coming into my life. I am saved, and that's enough. Okay, but there is a promise of the inheritance. God not only gives us an inheritance, but he says there are promises attached to that inheritance. Someone said that there are over 6,000 promises in the Bible. But we know that the first of that promise is that Christ, the Messiah, would come to save his people from sin. Well, let's dive in and let's look at the verse of scripture we're talking about. And it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Well, we know the first confirmation of that wonderful uh, inheritance of salvation, or rather the gift of salvation, came in Genesis chapter 3.15 in the form that God preached the first message and that the seed would come and crush the head of the serpent, but the serpent would bite the heel of the one that was crushing it. And we know Jesus Christ. The Bible says he was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. But while he was destroying the works, there was a plan in darkness to bring an end to his life. But that also failed because when they killed him and put him on the cross, that was our salvation. <laughs> well, well, well. So how should we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Well, what's salvation? Well, the initial part of salvation is that we're saved. We are saved. We have a permanent abode with the Son. Why? Because the life that we have is imparted to us by the Father through the Son. And remember, the Father is the one that sent the Son to give us life. And that fellowship we have with God, the Father, is through the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we're divinely connected to the throne of God. And therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have peace with God the Father. Well, we have been given the, whole, the witness of the Spirit of God that we know that we are His children and are cold heirs with Christ. Well, what is the promise? When we look at Romans, it tells us that we have the Spirit that cries Abba. That is the witness of our spirit, that we have a cry in our heart for the Father, but we also know that He is the Creator of all things. All right, well, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 tells us, Let us fear then, though a promise of entering his rest is left open, some of you would seem to have fallen short. Now, understand this. We all fall short of the glory of God because we are sinners. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. But understand that God told the people in our day, the New Testament, speaking of the past, speaking of the past, it says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 down, it says, Therefore, just as the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. There your fathers put me to the test, though they saw my works for 40 years. And therefore, I was provoked by this generation, and I said, they shall, um, excuse me, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Also, so he says, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter in my rest. Now, the Bible tells us here, in also Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, take care, be careful, be warned, brothers and sisters, that none of you has an evil heart of unbelief that falls away from the living God. You say, wait a minute, I thought we have a permanent abode. Well, is this talking about the salvation of going to heaven 
or does it talk about the promise of entering into the promised land? We're going to look at this. Now, is this just talking about the eternal salvation or is this, or it is something else that we should look into? Well, let's look back into the story of Exodus. One of the things that I've learned that history teaches us something about ourselves, where we come from, where we are, and where we're going. History teaches that, right? When you look at the history, you say, I know what happened, I know where I am, and I know hopefully where I'm going. Now, those that know history will always have something to say. I remember taking a history class uh, in a Bible college, and it's interesting that out of everything that was said, a few things I remember, but of everything that was said, the history teacher said, whoever knows history will never lack something to say. Now, they say that curiosity killed the cat. You do believe that, right? Don't put your head where it doesn't belong. But ignorance leads us to the destruction of our future. If you're ignorant, if we are ignorant about what happened in the past, then we're in trouble. So when we learn about our history, we may be able to correct some things that will keep us from a destructive future. Let's look at the origin of Israel. Let's look at the origin. Now, it's interesting that Ezekiel gives us a clear understanding, a clear picture of where Israel came from. Well, let's go back. Now, Ezekiel in chapter 16, verse 1 through 3, it says, The word of Adonai came to me, saying, Son of man, confront Jerusalem with her abominations, and say, Thus says the Lord Adonai to Jerusalem, Your origin and your birth are from the land of Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite. Your mother was a Hittite. Wow. Now think about this for a moment. Here is Ezekiel confronting Jerusalem, the people of God, and instead of going to Abraham saying, you know, you came out of Abraham, you were blessed, and he goes back to the very origin of their birth to discuss something, and that is that they rebelled. If you read chapter 16, it talks about prostitution, about how they prostituted themselves, how they went uh, away from God, and yet they are his people. Now, we're going to look at verse 4 because it's important. It says, As for your youth, or excuse me, as for your birth, on the day you were born, your umbilical cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water for cleansing. You were not rubbed with salt, nor were you swaddled at all. Now notice this whole this whole thing is really awesome, isn't it? When you read this, you say, "Wow, wait a minute, there's a lot there." He confronts Jerusalem, not from the point of Abraham when he came out, but from the point of origin where they were, and he says, "Confront their abominations. What abominations? The things that they were doing were the things that they were doing when they were in Babylonia." And he says. You haven't changed yet. You're still working under the umbilical cord of Babylonia. You have not been cut off yet. You're still acting as pagans, as heathens. Confront them, son of man, and say to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth is from the land of Canaanite, your father was an Amorite, you're acting like your father, and your mother was a Hittite. You are living the way you came out of instead of having a change. And watch this. Verse 4 tells us why. Because it tells us they were not cut off. Ezekiel gives us insight into the origin, the character, and doings of Israel. Now watch this. The Amorites were a principal branch of the Canaanites, the main idea of the Hittites was that they were children of an idolatrous nation that occupied Canaan. Now watch this. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm giving you a history lesson here. So please, if you just tuned in, you want to go back and definitely start from the beginning. The father of Abraham was Terah. Terah was an idol worshiper and a servant of the great king, hunter, and warrior Nimrod. Wow. This goes way back, doesn't it? And that's why 
I have purposed in my heart to put as much memory of the genealogy as I can, even from the time of Adam all the way to Joseph. As I did that, the puzzle began to come together in my mind. I understood a lot of things. Now, there are things that the Jews know that we don't know, but it's there. The information is there. They have Sunday school, as we call Sunday school material, that we can learn from that confirms why the Bible says certain things. So Tara was the father of Abraham, and he was an idol worshiper, and he actually served in Nimrod's time. And now it was through Abraham's father that came the Israelites, the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, the Moabites, and the Amorites. Terah's father, I mean, excuse me, Abraham's father, Terah, he's the, he, is, he is connected with this whole entire thing. Now, Nimrod was the founder of the Babylonian and the Assyrian Empire. This is correspondence to the historian Josephus and Moses. Now, understand, you remember the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel was constructed and influenced by Nimrod, who was not really a good king. And his origin is interesting because he comes from the, the, the tribe of Cush, who is also the son or the grandson of Ham, who came from Noah. So you think about this. Ham saw his father naked. Something happened there because the Bible says that Noah woke, awoke and he said he knew what his son did to him. Well, I'll leave that to your discretion. But from that, Noah curses up to the fourth generation. Cain. Canaan, the Canaan land, curses them. And watch this now. Nimrod means rebellion or valiant. So he was fearless. He was courageous. He was heroic. He was bold. But he was also foolish because he did not follow the God of heaven. Now, the father of Abraham, Terah, came to the line, came through the line, excuse me, came through to or through the line of Noah. That should be through. His father was Seth. Now, when you go through the whole genealogy, Seth came out of the ark with Noah. All right. The promised seed of Abraham, the Hebrew, I said Hebrew there, because there were no Hebrews when they were in Canaan. God began to call them Hebrews when in Genesis he came out. Now, the promised seed of Abraham is the seed of, uh, the seed of Abraham is Isaac. And we know that Isaac gave birth to Jacob. So now watch this. Jacob brought forth the 12 sons of Israel through four women. Who are the four women? We know that they are Leah. We know that it is Rachel, Zillah, and Balah. These four women actually brought forth the whole tribe of Israel. Now I want to say something here which is very important. The whole tribe of Israel is dependent not so much even on Jacob because he had the seed, but the four women that I say the church, the pillars that stand on. When you go to the Old Testament, you're going to find these powerful women of God and how God used them. They call them the matrian. It's just like we have the patriarchs. God used them. And they're in the tabernacle of Moses, and one day we're going to get to that. Very powerful message, and they are the ones that God used to bring forth Israel. Now, they went into Egypt. Now, watch this. I said, we're talking about, remember the beginning, such a great salvation? Well, they went into Egypt. We know the story. And they were slaves until Moses was sent by God to deliver them from the king of Egypt. Right? We know the story, the Ten Commandments. Who was the, the name of the man that uh, did the Ten Commandments again? Uh, Charleston Heston, man, I, Charlton, excuse me, Charlton Heston, and uh, you know, I, I saw the movie a few times, but the thing that gets me the most is when he, you know, he's, he's up in the mountain, and Joshua and Moses' wife is sitting down in the, you know, on, uh, in, the, in the, in the tents, you know, below the mountain, of course, and Joshua asks his wife, Moses' wife, has anyone ever seen God and survived? And she said, no, not that I know of. And he said, well, look. And Moses comes down, and he had white hair at that time. It wasn't fully white yet, but he had, you know, pepper-type uh, hair. And he comes down, he has a beard, and he's, he has a gleam in his eye. 
And Joshua looks at him and he says, um, he says, um, is God a man? He said, no, he is not a man. He kind of brushed it off. He said, he is eternal mind. Wow. That blows my mind. That God is eternal mind. Mm -hmm. The Lord performed 10 miracles in the sight of Israel and then led them through the Red Sea to Mount Sinai where they received the law. Wow. Now, let me ask you a question. Does that sound like a safe people to you? I mean, think about this. He brought them out, 10 plagues. They saw it. And remember, they had been crying for years. And they were in Egypt in the time of Pharaoh for at least 215 years. From the time they were called out of Abraham is 430 years. And they've been suffering ever since. Now understand that God saw the sufferings of Israel even when, he, when they were a seed inside of Abraham's loin. Oh Lord, what he sees, I wish I could see sometime. Ten plagues. Brought them out of Egypt through the water. Now, how many preachers have you heard? And they came through the Red Sea. <laughs> and they gave them salvation. And I've heard a lot of scholars say, when they came through the Red Sea, they were saved. The Spanish, cuando vinieron por la agua, ahí estaba su salvación. When they came through the water, there was the salvation. So I gave you three versions. <laughs> but there's only one salvation. And you can't say, well, they weren't quite saved yet. Uh, I don't think so. Because God led them. They prayed. God, you know, they saw the fire. But something happens. Now watch this. When they came through the Red Sea, the Lord cut the umbilical cord that tied them to the land of slavery so that they can learn how to breathe the perfect word of God mm -hmm. and cause him and cause them, not him, cause them to live by faith in God. Now think about this. Let's just go back for a second to Ezekiel. As for your birth, on the day you were born, your umbilical cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water for cleansing. You were not, you were never rubbed with salt, nor were you swaddled at all. Listen to what he says here. Now, if you don't cut the umbilical cord when the child is born, you can harm the child and the mother. And so the midwives were very careful to cut it, tie it, this way they will be safe. And it's interesting how that umbilical cord dries up. You know, when you see the baby, they cover it because it's very fragile, but then it dries up and it just kind of falls off and people keep it as a memory. Well, here we see God saying, I cut you off from the land of Babylonia. I cut you off from the place you came from and I want to take you out. Listen, they were saved people. But they neglected such great salvation because of their disobedience. They did not enter into the promised land. Because Israel disobeyed God and would not believe his promise of entering into the land provided for them. They wandered for 40 years in the desert and did not enter into the rest of the blessing. Now think about this. They were slaves to the desert very close to the promised land. Imagine that. I mean, some of them could have got him says, listen, you know what? I ain't, I ain't listening to that. I'm getting up. I'm going into the promised land. But they didn't have enough strength to fight the giants and to fight all those people that were in the promised land. And so they had to stay in the desert and they had to die out until the next generation came in. But watch the neglect. Watch. Did they neglect the salvation? They didn't circumcise their sons. They neglected the covenant that he made with Abraham to circumcise him, to bring him in. Watch this. Ishmael was born before the circumcision. Isaac was born after the circumcision. Because it would be through the circumcision that Israel would be born and come into the full blessing. And yet they were cut off because, watch this, although they were cut off from the land of Egypt, in their hearts, they were never cut off from the from the umbilical cord that they had to Babylonia. Think about that. And finally, Joshua, after all their sufferings, takes them through the land, through the uh, Jordan River, to the border of the Canaan promised land. And we know that they took it because God, 
you know, they went through the Jordan and we see the Ark of the Covenant. They carried it. And something happens here that is awesome. In the middle of the Jordan, after everybody passes through, Joshua takes 12 stones and he places them in the middle of the Jordan. Watch this. And he's standing there and that the priests are standing there with the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulder. And he places the 12 stones and they pass over and then the water closes and those stones are still there to this day as a memory, a memorial that Israel, you have been cut off from Babylonia. Be obedient to God. That generation, Israel, did not enter into God's best. Because why? Well, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19 and 20 says, If you are willing and obey you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will devour, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of Adonai has spoken. If you rebel, you will be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of Adonai has spoken. You say, what about the new commandment? Well, do we have a command in the new in the, in the new commandment? <laughs> no. In the new testament. You want to call it the new commandment? Okay, fine. But look what Jesus says. <laughs> you are my friends. Now they're saved. Listen, they're, aren't we saved? You are my friends. If you do whatsoever, I command you. We're his children. But we really act like his friends. In other words, a friend sticks closer to the brother. We will not abandon those things that the Lord has given us if we simply obey what he commands. What is commandments? Just go back to the Old Testament and you read them for yourself. You do your study. Obedience is the way to all the blessings of God. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Look at that picture for a moment and remember that God called you to enter into that place, that inheritance of your salvation. You are saved. You are signed, sealed, and delivered but don't you want to enter into God's best? God bless you. Have a wonderful, spirit-filled day. Amen.